this session, we are going to present a couple of short presentations from the world's leading designers. They are Lei Kun Tan, the co-founder of Nature Squared, Yiling Yan Ning Ng, the founder of the Fabric Lab, on the film, Circular Magic in Nature, People and Planet. And our moderator is Kay Liu, the Circular Fashion Program Director of Redress. Let's welcome all of them. Welcome everyone for joining me today for this discussion. It's my pleasure to moderate this discussion in circular magic in nature, people and planet. I would like to open this discussion by one big environmental challenge, which is waste. According to the UN, the world now produces over 2 billion tons of municipal solid waste every year, which means everyone, every day, all of us throw away 0.74 kilograms of waste, which is shocking, really. Why is there so much waste around us? Is it the way that how we produce things? Is it the way that how we design, how we make things? Is it the way that how we consume things? Also, is it our values being so skewered by the amount of things that surround us, you know, that we no longer really care where things are from, what things are made of, how is it made, who made them, and what happened to them when we no longer want them anymore? And most importantly, what does constitute value for things that we consume every day? It's all, I just threw you a bunch of questions for all of us to think about. At the same time, we know that when there's a challenge, there are great opportunities, right? And circular economy are often, you know, presented um, as a great solution you know, to waste in particular. And creativity, which I hugely believe in, that is going to find us way, you know, to realize this, um, this concept. So today, I'm going to bring you two brilliant, you know, fascinating makers, and whose work, you know, um, integrate circularity, reimagine nature, as well as benefiting people. So the first speaker I would like to introduce to you is Lei Kun Tan, co-founder of Nature Square, and whose work uses over 100 natural materials, and most of them is actually waste. That applies for different type of surfaces, you know, like creating amazing, stunning, exquisite, luxurious surfaces for things like cars, for things like interiors and objects and beyond. So Lei, Lei Kun, would you like to say hello to everyone? Hi, everybody. Lovely to be with you. And our second speaker today is Elaine Ng, the founder of the Fabric Lab and also the chief material innovator at Nature Square. What a fantastic title that is. You know, whose works combine <laughs> textiles, <laughs> whose work combine textile, biomimicry, electronics, interior, as well as insulation. Hello, Elaine, nice to see you again. Hi. Hi. I just can't wait to hear your presentation. So at first, we will have Lei Kun presenting to us, followed by Elaine, and then we'll go into um, some questions. Here for you, the stages, Lei Kun. Thanks so much. Hello, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this session. And with such a terrific introduction from Kay, I'm uh, launching straight into showing you some of our natural materials that we work with, mostly waste, as, as Kay said, uh, and, and thus all sustainable. Here you see part of the vast array of materials that we have, and they range from eggshells to, to, to tobacco leaves, from mussel shells to fruit skins, uh, from nut shells to porcupine quills. So what we do with uh, this diversity of materials is uh, transform them uh, using ingenuity and innovation into uh, 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 solid surfaces that get applied to uh, architecture, to product, and to interiors. 
there you can see our mantra, which is uh, nature's waste, our precious materials. And basically, this is a one-to-one a, a -one map, uh, this uh, picture onto the previous one, where uh, for the natural material that you saw, uh, it gets transformed into uh, the surfaces, but actually it's one of many because from the 100 plus different natural materials that we work with, uh, we actually create uh, over 3,000 uh, unique surfaces. We are often asked why we do what we do, uh, and the answer to us is, is very simple. Um, Today, the, the environmental uh, imperatives, uh, global poverty and inequality, uh, all these issues are very widely publicized and accepted. But uh, 20 years ago, when Paul Hoover, my partner and I started this venture, uh, sustainability and circularity uh, were much less accepted uh, as, as, as imperatives. And we felt very strongly that if we were to make a difference, however small, to, to contribute to sustainable development, then we needed to come up with an answer that was holistic, that would address environmental, social and financial responsibility. So this picture that you see here is of a dump site that is on our doorstep where our production facilities are in the Philippines. And it is from this exact dump site that we aim to divert uh, as, as much waste as, as possible. Uh, this young man is a, uh, is a member of a fishing community uh, in the Philippines that, that we support. Uh, it's a very overfished area and uh, we buy their waste shell, uh, thus uh, augmenting their livelihood. Uh, and we do so with, uh, in collaboration with the Zoological Society of London. They are a big conservation agency that uh, some of you may better know for, for the fact that they run uh, London Zoo. Uh, another question I'm often asked is, why are we in the Philippines? Well, the Philippines is one of 18 uh, mega biodiversity centers in the world. Uh, they are also, uh, they have the, I think they are ranked fifth uh, for the number of plant species. Uh, fourth for bird species, they're part of the coral triangle, uh, but uh, as you may also uh, realize, according to global finance, they are the 76th poorest country in the world, and, uh, and, and they export a huge amount of their human talent. So for us, uh, the, you know, the challenges to sustainable development there are huge. And we felt that by, by working there, by setting up our, our, our operations there, uh, we would be making a, a significant, or we would hope to make a significant contribution. So you've heard us talk about uh, using waste materials uh, and uh, human skills, but what we were really trying to do as well was to create highly skilled jobs. And we, we do this by taking indigenous uh, inlay and weaving skills, which when we arrived there, we found were largely being applied to the homeware and souvenir market. Uh, and we said we are going to uh, uh, take this to a quality that's never, ever been seen before. So we aim uh, to we aimed what we did at the highest end of the market. So for the last 20 years, we have been supplying super yachts, private jets, uh, villas, palaces. And, uh, you know, people ask, why do you set the bar so high? Uh, and and there, there are various answers. One, of course, uh, is that it gives us an unassailable market position. Uh, the other, uh, very importantly, is for, for the people, for our people, it shows what they can do and that engenders a sense of self-worth and, and self-respect that is invaluable. And finally, of course, since we're talking about circularity, uh, paradoxically, if you have a quality that is, that is heirloom quality, you have products that are treasured, then they are never thrown away. And, and therefore, you don't need to dispose of them. And for us, you know, the ultimate 
circularity is is something that has 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 huge longevity I am now going to talk to you about uh, some of the projects we have done so that you can uh, perhaps better relate uh, to, to what we physically do. Uh, this image is from a bathtub that is uh, on a super yacht, so very much an ultra high net worth project. Uh, it is clad inside and out with eggshell. We love eggshells. It is a ubiquitous material, you know, it, it's easily diverted from landfill, uh, uh, and yet it has all these design possibilities. So it is inlaid in the typical heritage eggshell inlay way, which is very labor intensive, uh, 2000 eggshells in 20 man days per square meter. But, uh, you know, combining it as we do with our Swiss and German technology and, and cutting edge technical solutions, uh, we spent over a year, uh, over 3000 R&D hours to get to a thing of beauty, but also a fully functional bathtub that, you know, can be scrubbed out and sat in and all the things that bathtubs are used for. This is uh, another one of my favorite projects. This is for Rolls-Royce. Uh, these are natural feathers uh, that we use in this dashboard for a Phantom 8. And uh, if you watch this video, you will see how we did it. Nature Squared are renowned for creating beautiful things for beautiful spaces. They have created a abstract installation of natural feathers. It is approximately 3,000 feathers which are prepared and sorted. The feathers are all selected in different sizes, cleaned, brushed and prepared. And also with small angles for a stitch operation to wove it. And it is really a preparation that it is nearly like the skin, like the surface of the bird. The opportunity of the gallery concept itself allows us to work with the content of natural products that never seen before in the automotive world. So I hope uh, that gave you some idea about the Rolls-Royce uh, collaboration. The next one is a furniture collection called Exploring Eden that we developed with the very creative Bethan Gray. Uh, we launched this at uh, Salone de Mobile in Milan last year. And uh, you can see here pieces that she designed using waste goose feathers, waste chicken feathers, pheasant feathers, uh, and various waste shells. Uh, and while showing at Saloni, one of one of the great highlights was that I met Elaine and uh, we had an immediate meeting of minds. Uh, Elaine and 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 we share uh, a commitment to using craft uh, to to seek uh, 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 to seek our sustainable development goals. And with her, we decided to reimagine the way we use our materials so that we can use even more waste materials while cutting down uh, the, the, the time that it takes for production. So uh, you heard me talk about the bathtub, which used 2000 eggshells and took 20 days to do to inlay a square meter. Well, with Elaine, uh, we are aiming to use 20,000 eggshells for a square meter and produce in two days um, a product that is very, very exciting and that she will tell you about shortly. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Lei Kun. That was absolutely fascinating. It's like, you know, going through your presentation and watching that video cutting, you know, the feather was just nuts, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to pass the stage to you now, Elaine, to talk about your work as equally as fascinating. Here you go, Elaine. Hi, everyone. Oh, can everyone hear me? Because Yes, we can right. hear you. Hi, everyone. Oh, great, great. So I'm not quite sure what the quarantine network is like. Right. Um, yes, hi, everyone. I'm Elaine. Um, I'm the founder of the Fabric Lab. A lot of people are quite confused what the Fabric Lab is. Just give you a quick introduction. Um, 
it's a peculiar textile studio that brings like extreme spectrums together ai and nature uh, artificial intelligence and um handmade and of course smart production and handmade how do we maximize the idea of craftsmanship but also make it very uh, productive at the same time uh a little bit about my background um i was trained as uh, a weaver by trade this this environment I'm very familiar with. I'm always very fascinated how amazing these machinery and looms are, how fast um, textiles can be woven um, in, in the traditional mills. But at the same time, I was very frustrated um, about it because um, each of these looms are often constraining the type of material that we can put through it. So for example, like a silk loom, uh, you can't just shuffle uh, bamboo into it, so it restricted uh, the canvas that designers uh, uh, can 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 be used. Uh, so then that pushes me to start my own studio, the Fabric Lab. Uh, when you can come through the door, you probably see more peculiar objects, electronics, three um, D printed sculptures, uh, and machineries more than textiles. I. I designed a fabric lab in a way that how we can actually bring in different machineries and work with them together, like 3D printers with Jack Art Loom, explore the opportunities of cross-disciplinary. And this approach really helped me to develop a new way of thinking along different projects. And for example, uh, this is probably one of the sculpture you get to see um, in, in, in my studio, it's a, a 3D printed uh, sculpture, but what you can actually see um, is when the lights are, are moving. Sorry, this is a video, by the way. Can, can we play the video? Um, so when you see the lights moving uh, on the video, uh, that's actually reflecting the air quality data that uh, you can choose on um, the kiosk. Uh, it was a commission project by UBS. We really wanted to open up conversations about air quality uh, concerns uh, around the globe. It is something that often people felt like we couldn't see. Um, but when air quality is really bad, we can taste. Um, so why don't we visualize it? It is project like this raise concern about um, the consequences of our human actions, or how how we we behave in in terms of the way how we produce, it, and and uh, the way how we work in factories, uh, creating all the pollutions. Talk about that um, circular way of making. It's really really important as a must sort of a way to go forward um, from now on because there's only limited resources on the planet. We must be smarter the way how we think and how we use our resources. And this take to my next journey um, of design that I want to share with you all today. So about a year ago, I was uh, invited by Nature Square to visit the Philippines in Cebu. And um, I was very can we go to the next slide? Because I've been clicking. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I've been invited by Nature Square to, to Cebu and visit the factories. And being trained as a weaver, I was invited uh, to work with the weave department and explore new opportunities and design new collections uh, with materials that's around. So what you're seeing on the screens is uh, abaca fiber, uh, a native material to the Philippines uh, belongs to the banana uh, uh, fiber family. And it's such a strong fiber and so interesting. It's water resistance and um, it's often being required in medical supplies. Um, and the training week was so interesting that I, I made new friends with everyone in the weave department and amazing ladies. And we had such a great time. But actually, I had my eyes on something else. Um, so I, this object caught my eyes. Yes, Lacun was asking me, Elaine, why did you put this picture on? This was a, one of the very first picture that I've taken when I arrived at the showroom. Um, it's a bin that's made out of abalone shells. It's amazing, exquisite. The amount of uh, men labor 
that involved to make this bin was amazing and I was astonished by the craftsmanship. So then that really made my imagination go wild. I thought, if they can turn this into a bin, maybe they'll open up to do anything with their waste material from nature. So then I started looking at the archive and um, go down to the factory floors and look at all the artisans' work. Um, Eggshells inlay is one of the most well-known technique, um, and actually it has a long history. It came from the Tang Dynasty. Most of the time, it has always only been used as a surface decoration, um, and it's been so popular that it's still ongoing at the moment. Um, it takes a, roughly about 3,000 uh, eggshells per square meter, um, and it takes over 18 days to complete that. So it's a little slow, very labor intensive, and you think, oh, 3,000 eggshells, that's not bad. That's quite a lot of waste. But actually, there are 700 millions of eggshell waste per year. So that's nothing compared to what goes into the landfill. And the landfill is, of course, the capacity is, 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 is reaching its um, peak. And as Le Kun showed earlier, this is um, a, a, a sort of landfill that's near uh, our facilities, and that's many of them around. So I started to sort of look at what traditional people think of eggshells. It has no economic values and it's expensive to get rid of because it's, it's, it's sort of uh, difficult to clean people's thing because it's fragile. Um, and it has a very flat uh, and horizontal economy. Um, it doesn't go much further other than using as traditional art inlay, but that's only a small fraction of it. And then it does go to the landfill. So then I start to think, what is the sort of actual purpose of egg shell? And can we look at it as a material itself and look at the strength and the calcium, uh, the property, inherent property of eggshell? So if, you, if we sort of sit back and think a little bit about it, eggshell, it is actually made by nature as a shelter uh, to protect the egg content and the embryo. So it's a shelter material from nature, uh, architectural material from nature. So that became our, our um, starting point of looking at it. If it's good enough to grow something inside and protect it, it might be good enough for a human being as architectural material. So I... I started the research um, and spent a bit of time in the factory with a team and then I start sketching into an idea of creating a vision of an egg loop. Then I proposed to look in a nature square looking, can we actually explore more than just using it for inlay, but actually use as a, a batch material itself to create a formula um, to extend the life of eggshells. So that's the egg loop approach and a circular approach. Um, so we, we began our experiment looking at um, the waste of the waste. Waste of the waste starting point was actually um, the waste of the eggshell inlay. Um, I've, something I've learned here, not all the eggshells can be used for eggshell inlay for the traditional craft. Um, there are waste from that too. So we started from that and also connecting with all the all the, the usual suppliers from the central kitchens and, and local bakeries um, for, for eggshells. And then we, we started looking at them in fragments and different size and shapes. Um, and then I didn't quite want to um, add in any additives in terms of colors into to, to that because I felt there must be a cleverer way to bring in colors. Um, so then if you if you can bake egg to make cake, then you must be able to bake eggshell to bring in colors. Uh, so we started to, to, to use a baking method to bring in different um, shades uh, into the eggshells to as a starting point. And then we experiment more by uh, bringing different uh, natural dyes um, to it. Um, here we were starting some experiments, bringing madder, uh, chlorophyllin, and indigo.
and then there's a video you'll be able to see um, how different eggshells absorb like the dye differently and and provide its own characters And when we were working um, um, with the dye, what was really interesting was actually the way how the extra fragments start to mix together. It reminds us of terrazzos, and that's where the, our first product um, sort of were born. Oh, okay. Can I just? Ch oh, yeah. So my sc screen actually freeze. So I, I I'm not quite sure which slide I'm in at the moment. Can someone just remind me? The one with the beautiful light bulb. <laughs> um, I'm looking at a wall? Yes, you are, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I got distracted by the light. <laughs> now is the one with the tile, the brown one. Okay, my my clicker is not responsive, um, but maybe the studio can take over the slide that I can just talk through it quickly. <laughs> yes, that's great. Yes, I can see that. That's good. I can just, if you go back to that slide, I can just uh, talk through like that. Um, yes. So I really want to, to share a little bit about one of my favorite natural dye collection. This is uh, chlorophyllin. So it's extract from the leaves. Um, we spent so much time with our computer and we felt it was be really nice to bring the literal green um, and greenness indoors. So actually we're easier on our eyes and really bring um, nature um, in, indoor. And, and, and the, the way how natural dye and eggshell um, react with each other is amazing uh, because it will be absorbed by the eggshell itself. And then slowly during the process, it also disperses the dyes back into the batch and it creates this um, really beautiful of like uh, sort of color on each of the tiles. So we created a first um, calcium bricks collection that's based on eggshell um, content. And this entire wall is made of eggshell. Could you believe that? I it, I literally teared up when we first put up this wall because we've been working so hard throughout the year um, to commercialize this, um, how we can create the balance of handmade um, and, and yet also um, able to produce in the right quantity and time frame um, that it can uh, provide product. So can you go next slide? Um, and because we didn't just fixate on one idea of making the tiles itself, um, it's, it's a formula that we have developed with eggshell. So it enables us to actually mold into different objects that can complement the environment. Um, so we've created this containers and you can actually see on this container in one is make, made with uh, bigger eggshells fragments and one with smaller. So the intensity of colors uh, comes through differently. And these are all the inherent qualities of the uh, material itself. Um, and then the next slide. Um, here's just a hint of matter, how um, matter works really well with uh, chlorophyllin as well, just to show um, how they can complement each other. And then next. Um, and, and, and I really want to show this as one of the final slides because uh, this is a matter um, uh, war tiles, but actually also mixed with some of the bake elements. So it really shows the quality of eggshells um, can help the baking process and the natural dyes process to translate really well. So it's a really lovely material to work with. Um, and on the final slide, I just really want to say this is just the beginning of how we work with uh, waste of the waste and um, Within the portfolio, we're really trying to look in all different natural material ways with uh, different uh, qualities. And most importantly, uh, with this exploration within the year, we managed to um, create 
and work with eggshells five times faster um, and use 10 times more the natural waste materials um, and really, really hope that we can make better impact and circular designs together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elaine, there was, you know, when I saw this slide and now watching it live and seeing the color is so beautiful in the way that, you know, you're going through the process, the thoughts behind it, the development, it's just absolutely insane, actually, and it's so beautifully, um, it's stunning, actually. I've got a number of questions for you. <laughs> I mean, first of all, it just, I find it so interesting that, you know, you're using eggshell. I certainly don't see eggshell um, the same anymore. You know? <laughs> I would really have to think hard what I should do with the eggshells after eating an egg, crack an egg open. So why are you so keen on using organic waste? I mean, it's something that we often think like when it's organic waste, like it doesn't matter. It will decompose by itself. But it doesn't actually because the way that how we consume, the amounts that we consume and also you know, the planet cannot cope with the amount of waste. So why do you choose organic waste? Uh, um, I'll I, I go first, if you like, Elaine. Uh, yeah, uh, mine's a very simple answer, which is that if it goes uh, into landfill, uh, organic waste creates methane. And methane is 27 times worse uh, than carbon dioxide, uh, you know, for, 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 for its effect. So, you know, for us, that's, it's very clear that, that organic waste is what needs to be diverted as much as possible. Sorry, that, that's, that, that's our technical answer. Thank you, Leikun. And Elaine, do you have something to add here? Sorry, I often, like, when I thought of the questions, I actually think of you as a pair. <laughs> so, Elaine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are a pair, a terrible <laughs> pair. Yes, would you like I, to add I to that, Elaine? Just to just to add on top of Lekun's answer, I mean, that's a that's a, a really good to clarify um, how everyone's got this misunderstanding of, of natural waste will just decompose because it doesn't. And then um, what happened next is the methane gas. But as a designer, I'm taking advantage of, of um, Nature Square Network or what they've built already, because the most important thing is when they already have a good supply chain and network of where the waste ways come from and how they've already been managed to clean and started to apply them in their own products, but just not as much as they wish. That's a very good opportunity to tap in as a designer to see how we can work together to amplify the effect and application in, um, to, 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 to go further. Um, because as an individual designer, it would be very difficult to work with organic material. In fact, we can have the idea we can have the prototype, but we won't have the entire supply chain and system to back up the idea and execute it. So I think this is one of the reasons that I did wait for quite a long time before I, I started on anything that's completely uh, as an organic waste um, to, to do a big project like this. And I thought um, collaborating and working with Nature Square is a perfect opportunity to set an example that um, ecosystem needs to be well inserted when you design uh, with organic waste. Thank you then. It's so much we can learn from nature too, isn't it? You know, and um, so, I mean, what is about your, I'm going to ask all my questions around your collaborations because I find it absolutely fascinating. And, uh, you know, so, so um, what is really are your key messages you want to come across of your collaboration? What do you want to tell people? Why are you doing this? Leikun, do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. Um, we would like people to look at waste differently. We would like to redefine luxury um, because I think there is, you know, this very strong uh, perception that for something to be luxurious and valued, the raw material needs to be something that is rare. Uh, and that's the paradigm we're trying to break. We are also trying to, to say, look, you can do in a developing country with, you know, clever design and, and great processes, something that is cutting edge uh, and really, you know, can be, is, is second to none. That's great. 
Elaine, anything else you would like to add to that? Yeah, I think, sorry, I, I, I couldn't hear the question properly in the first time. Could you repeat the question, Kate? No, what is the, what is the, what do you want people to hear? What do you want people to see of your collaboration? What is the key messaging that you would like to put across through your collaboration with, uh, with Nature Squared? I, I certainly are hoping that people can see um, natural material from a different lens and see new application for it because Nature Square is very well known for the bespoke work and it's absolutely amazing. Every time everyone sees it, they, they feel it's really, really special. But at the same time, um, there, there are so well caged for the bespoke market. Um, as a designers and also to make a bigger impact uh, with, with these materials, I'm always, always hoping to explore a market that's for people that understand craftsmanship and the importance of sustainability, but at the same time, um, that it can apply into wider projects um, too. Thank you there. And I mean, both of you mentioned people. I mean, Lei Kun, you, you talk about people so much, whether it's the, you know, people who, who you source their materials from, you know, the people who make this stuff. And, you know, so, but I've got a problem with circularity sometimes because quite often, you know, the principle in itself and also the ultimate goals don't really address their human issue, don't address their social side of work, whether it's the welfare of the makers, where it's the, you know, respect to traditions and culture, whether it's the value of craft, I find that is quite often missing in circularity, which your project and your individual work is so much about that. Can you share your thoughts on this? Can we go for you first, Elaine, this time? <laughs> did you hear the question okay? Yes, I did. Um, I think, pro Circularities and, and actually to all projects, um, people often should come first in a way because a um, bit about my background, I, I did a project in Guizhou so working with ethnic minorities for the past seven years and I'm continue working with them. And people often brings really important values in projects and in cultures and what they see and a lot of the craftsmanship are only able to pass on to the next generation by hand. Sometimes the way how things are being made is very difficult to be archived. You can't just computerize and, and lock it in, in, in into your Excel file as such. Um, so in, in sort of in, in the circularity of making, it is really important to have that as one of the first priority because people are talents and they are also the most important resources that we have and if we don't respect that well in projects um it is really difficult to move forward because then they also won't understand the value where you're trying to make changes um as a very good um mindset in nature square i had was actually when i first um met them when they invited me to the philippines they said Actually, Elaine, you should go to see the factories and how the way we work with um, our artisans and, and the team in, in Cebu is able then we can carry on the conversations. And I thought that was that was amazing because not a lot of company would open up for them to for strangers uh, to invite strangers to the facilities and, and look into like, you know, all the, the secret way of making. So I, I, I was actually um, very surprised in a way, but but that also shows we have very similar values. Thank you. It's, it is that human touch, isn't it? Here, you know, so important to your collaborations, and I know like people is so important when I talk to you, Lakeun. And how do you? What's your thoughts on this? You know, like it is. I feel like the principle it is missing that human value in circularity in itself. If you just look at it, you know, from an academic uh, point of view. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Elaine has talked about the making. Uh, perhaps I'll talk about the sourcing. Uh, the fact is, you know, that you cannot tell uh, people who live in these communities uh, to respect their environment more, you know, to, uh, to, to be conscious of these issues without giving them an alternative. And, and if we cannot augment livelihood and say, you know what, if you stop dynamite fishing, if you stop blowing your shells to smithereens, if you keep them whole, we will give them, we will give you money for them. Uh, you know, that gives them a, a, an alternative uh, and it opens their minds. It's no good going and lecturing people about what they should or shouldn't do. I mean, we need to be more constructive about that and engage. So when we go to, to the communities that we want to work with, you know, very often our first question is, what is your waste? What are you throwing away? Um, you know, what can we use? In other words, the question is, how can we help? Rather than wagging our finger at them and saying you should not, right? Yeah. And also, I, I, I really um, love to, you know, carry on this conversation as well, because, you know, like not only like you're buying that from them and sourcing, for them to understand the value in waste also, what other people see as waste, and it is so important. I would love, I've got so many more questions, but I know that we're running out of time. And actually, we've got uh, questions from the audience too. And it is part of my question, so I'm get, going to read it out to you. So people usually think luxury brands are using the newest, the best materials. However, your brand is adopting recycled and unwanted materials. How would you promote them to high-end customers? Leikun, would you like to try this, uh, answer this question? Yes, sure. I mean, ironically, and, and to be honest, you know, at the highest uh, level of the market, um, you do have some, some people who engage with, with the full, the, the principles of what we stand for. But to be honest, very often, they just want something that looks beautiful, that clearly is, you know, an incredible quality, and that matches their scheme and is the right blue. And uh, we need to cater for that. You know, we need to produce things that are beautiful, where the first, the first point of engagement is, wow, this is incredible. I haven't seen this before. Um, you know, can I have it? And, and, and bluntly speaking, that is a starting point for many discussions. Thank you there, Lei Kuni. It's very true, isn't it? How do you get people, I mean, something that Elaine, you talk about also, like how do you get people to see things and what they think, what constitutes the value, you know, like, so, you know, so it's so important to rethink and redesign the system. Thank you so much for joining us. I would like to wrap up this panel by a quote that I saw. It's basically a recent speech by the UN Secretary General he said, humanity is waging war on nature. This is suicidal. Nature always strikes back and is already doing so with growing force and fury. Human activities are at the root of our descent towards chaos. But that means human action can help to solve it. And I think you two are one of the two heroes here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye, Elaine. Bye-bye, Lekun. -bye,